my dear sisters and brothers the eleven blessings of the mother and shri aurobindo to all of you from shri aurobindo ashram delhi branch let me start with guru vandana dhyana moolam gurur murti puja moolam gurupadam mantra moolam gurur vakyam moksha moolam guru kripa dhyana moolam gurur murti the essence the focal point of uh, meditation or concentration is uh, the guru's picture puja moolam guru padam the focus of uh, the worship puja should be the guru's feet mantra moolam guru or vakyam the essence of the mantra is uh, the utterance of the guru and uh, finally and uh, last but uh, the most important without which everything that we do stays uh, incomplete imperfect and meaningless moksha moolam guru kripa liberation liberation not from the cycle of birth and death but liberation from the bondage of uh, desires and attachments comes from the guru's grace kripa Now visualize a man he has just returned from work in the evening and uh, he tells his wife who has uh, delivered a child exactly a month ago pack up pick up a few things which you think are most precious or most essential we have to leave within a couple of hours leave for what we don't know where we are going and what we'll find there the man was my father and uh, i was that one year sorry one month old baby on the 15th of november 1947 and uh, that's what my father came and told my mother and uh, the three of us traveled on a rickety plane from karachi to delhi and landed in a refugee camp the first few years of my life therefore were naturally harsh and this harshness has its value as i realize today the result was that uh, the first time i saw an electric bulb in the house was at the age of about 7 and uh, the first time i saw a table fan the only fan we had in the house was at the age of about 10 and till then how do we manage in the summers uh by using that handheld fan and at night we would try to sleep outdoors rather than in a room and uh, my mother would hold that fan and fan me with it so that i'd get a whiff of air and i would fall asleep switch forward to age 17 1965 and i joined the all india institute of medical sciences as an mbbs student and uh, was paying only about i think 300 rupees a semester 600 rupees a year to get uh, the best education available best medical education available not only in india but perhaps in asia and one of the best in the world why before i finished that course why is i was in the final year there was a program that ran only for four years and i was one of the lucky part lucky beneficiaries of that program it was a program exchange program between the nafield foundation of the united kingdom and the all india institute of medical sciences under which two students from aims two final year medical students from aims went to england and uh, two students from there came to the all india institute of medical sciences my turn for that rather my eligibility for that was in 1969 and the procedure was that the top 10 students were picked up and interviewed and from amongst those two were selected 10 top boys those days it was thought that it will not be very safe to girl send a girl to england and that too if she is accompanied by a boy and therefore they interviewed only the boys and uh, the girls didn't protest they should have perhaps so anyway i was one of those 10 who were interviewed and don't think that i was first i used to stand first till i joined medical college after i joined medical college 
I took a conscious decision not to stand first. Why? For a variety of reasons. Because I wanted to be a well-rounded person, a complete person. And for getting those few extra marks which, which propel you to the top, you have to put in a lot of time which can be used more usefully elsewhere for becoming more of a complete person. Secondly, going to the top in an exam is not all about uh, knowing more and uh, being uh, better at your work. A lot of it is just techniques. Techniques which in fact are not only going to teach you anything worthwhile, in fact some of those techniques might be uneducational in nature. And thirdly, if you are always standing first, you invite the jealousy of your classmates. So your relations are much better if you are somewhere at the top but not at the absolute top. So it was a conscious decision. And I was not, I was not the top among those ten, but I was interviewed. And uh, I was asked a few questions, some I answered well, some I didn't answer well. But the last question was asked by an eminent cardiologist, Professor Sujoy B. Roy. Uh, he was glancing through my biodata, hobbies. One of the hobbies was history of medicine. Oh, history of medicine. Who invented the stethoscope? Sir Lenick invented it and uh, the idea came while he was taking a walk. It's nice to take a walk sometimes. <laughs> he observed a few children who were playing with a log or a tube and at one end some child was speaking something, at the other end of that I think was a log. The other child had applied its ears and he could hear a little louder. This gave him an idea. Why not use something like this to listen to the chest of a person, particularly because it was very impolite to take your ear very close to the chest of a woman. And most of the doctors were men. And uh, that's how he ended up inventing the stethoscope. So I told a little bit of this story. As soon as I started the story, he knew that I not only knew that Lenick had invented the stethoscope, but also how he got the idea. Very good, very good. Now you can go. Now, my hobby was history of medicine, but I didn't know everything in history of medicine. And everything that I knew or had read, I did not remember. Who put this idea in this person's mind that to ask me about the inventor of the stethoscope? And how was it that out of all that I had read, which was very little, this is something which I did remember. And I could immediately recall it at that moment. That is divine grace. And uh, psychologists, you know, call it the effect of recency. The last question, if you answered well, your evaluation in the interview goes up like this. This is the effect of recency. So I think that is what made my selection sure. And at the age of 21, I was in England for three months at St. Bartholomew's Medical College. And uh, that was at that time a very valuable, educative and uh, memorable experience. Continued in Ames, did my MD in Physiology and uh, for a year and a half I had to leave Ames because no job was available and uh, I was in the University College of Medical Sciences but then a job in Ames was advertised, came back to Ames in 1977 and uh, by 1986, I was an associate professor. And in 1987, one of our professors retired from the department and that post also fell vacant. Those days, you know, the professor's posts were vacancy based, not assessment based. It's not that the individual assessed and he was fit to be a professor, he was promoted to professorship. That didn't happen. Uh, it was vacancy based. So one post fell vacant and I was eligible by then. I applied. But then along with me applied many more, particularly three persons who were as much as 10 to 15 years older than me. Uh, one of them had been my teacher also when I was undergraduate while I was doing MBBS. And two of, and all three of them had been my teachers when I was doing post-graduation in the same department. But for the heck of it, I applied. My wife told me, uh, probably you will get the job. I told her, no, even if I were the director of the institute, I was in the selection committee, I would not give the job to myself. I applied for just for the heck of it, hmm? uh, because I was eligible. Because the director will have such a tough time if she selects me. The director was Professor Snebhargav at that time. Uh, 
because you know seniority is something which is objective and therefore safer to go by while promoting a person merit is questionable so i told her i would not give the job even to myself but then it so happened that uh, professor sneh bhargav wanted to send home the message that uh, merit counts i had by that time three books to my credit and about 40 publications of course that include a large number of abstracts presented in conferences but while counting them at least those days we counted everything so i had that and uh, professor sneh bhargav wanted to drive home the point that merit does count and then the two specialists uh, who were there in the selection committee one was professor lk kothari and another was professor prakash shetty professor lk kothari and professor shetty were both very honest upright men with uh, well known for their integrity and uh, i have the fortune of enjoying the affection of uh, both till now particularly professor lk kothari the son of professor ds kothari the famous dr ds kothari and uh, he's in his 90s and i have the privilege of enjoying a special affection of his so he was one of the uh, specialist experts on the selection committee the other professor shetty was not much older than me but we were both in the same field in the field of nutrition and uh, therefore he had known me for about 10 years uh, so these were the two men and after the interviews were over before the results were announced prakash called me prakash shetty the second expert who was uh, a friend along with uh, being an expert in that and he said ramesh uh, i'm not sure but probably they'll give you the job meaning it doesn't matter what happens but one thing which will not change irrespective of what the result is is our friendship that will continue so that and then it so happened that uh, this i ended up getting selected and uh, i was barely 40 you can say that it was a, a gift sent in advance by the divine as my as a birthday gift on my 40th birthday so that happened in 1987 but then you see that there was a constellation of factors that came into work out that miracle it was a miracle uh, perhaps not precedented and not repeated that sort of a miracle having professor snow sne bhargav a very courageous woman and a person of great integrity and who wanted to drive home this message two experts who were again very upright and uh, with all integrity and uh, the selection of the selection committee not getting altered in any way which also can happen sometimes not changing now all these things were again divine grace how i did in the interview and all these things put together was something that i could not have designed as i said i didn't expect it and yet it happened but then like uh, failure success also is not easy to handle perhaps it's more difficult to handle success than failure it was a spiritual test and uh, i don't know how well i did in that test but i must appreciate and admire and uh, remember respectfully those three seniors whom i had superseded whose love and affection i continued to enjoy even after this result was announced now why did the divine has to design this for me because you see anyone who is in the academics one of his dreams is that i should retire at least as a professor if not as a professor and head of the department this dream was uh accomplished before i was 40 and once you are a professor sooner or later in terms of seniority you'll also become the head of the department and if i didn't become head of the department too soon after that it was a grace again divine grace because every headship is a headache you can enjoy the professorship if you are not the head of the department so it was divine grace but then why was it why was this uh, aspiration of every person in academics to become at least a professor why was it uh, fulfilled at such an early age i think to make sure that i'll be saturated with worldly success and i'll be able to turn in a more meaningful way towards the spiritual path and uh, therefore uh, again i sometimes feel profound gratitude to the divine for having designed for me extremely comfortable and pleasant circumstances 
for fulfilling that dream of becoming a professor, which uh, every person in academics generally has. So it was done early, and uh, so that I would be saturated with it and will be able to turn early to the spiritual path. In contrast, look at uh, Sri Aurobindo's life, at least as lived on the surface. What were the circumstances that uh, gave a new direction to his life from the freedom struggle to the spiritual path, exclusively on the spiritual path? He was, of course, a Mahayogi right from birth. That is a different story. But on the surface, uh, that was the turning point. And uh, how did uh, that happen? Through difficult circumstances, through being in prison, in solitary confinement. And uh, in contrast, what sort of circumstances he gave me? Made me a professor before time so that I'll be able to give a new direction to my life. This is something that struck me when I was speaking on the Uttarpada speech for the first time in 1989, uh, I think, uh, which was, uh, no, uh, 2009. 2009, which was the 100th anniversary, uh, Shurabindu delivered the Uttarpada speech in uh, 1909. So 2009 was the 100th anniversary and I was to speak on this in one nivas, on the Uttarpada speech. That is when it struck me and it brought tears to my eyes. What sort of conditions you went through to give a new direction to your life and what sort of conditions you gave me? That was the <coughs> divine grace, again, doing its incomparable work on a disciple to give a direct, proper direction to him, to give, give proper guidance to him. This happened at the age of 40 and uh, within five years, when I was about 45, I was passing through a very difficult phase of life. And uh, it was on uh, the, I think, 12th of July, 1992, it was a Sunday and uh, I had had a night which was almost entirely sleepless. But still, I was up in the morning, as happens even after a sleepless night. I picked up the newspaper, and those days the newspapers carried a daily events column. I had a quick look at that, and almost at the top was, because of alphabetical order, Shiorabindu Ashram Delhi branch, uh, Satsang, 10 a.m. I had a vague idea of the place, and I thought, uh, let me go there and get some peace of mind. Listen to this satsang. It's not that I was uh, blind to matters religious and spiritual before that. But then uh, I used to read, read all types of books on religion and spirituality from different uh, traditions. Uh, but my main aim was that if some good thoughts keep going into me, I'll be able to live an ethically sound life. That's about all. And if I went any deeper, I didn't understand much and I thought, well, that is beyond me. But then, uh, I mean, I didn't go to, so I, I was not blind to matters religious and spiritual, but I didn't go to places of worship and ashrams. Even when I visited a temple, it was more to appreciate the architecture than out of a sense of devotion. In fact, I remember I was in, the, in front of a very famous temple in the South India, I will not name the temple. I was in front of it at the age of 24. And uh, I decided not to enter the temple. Why? Because outside the temple was displayed a board, donation so much, this type of darshan. You can go into the inner, sanct uh, what is called it, sanct uh, sacred uh, sanctorum. Uh, you can go right in there and the priest will perform a special puja for you so that all your wishes will be granted. And then as the donation comes down, the privileges go down. And finally, if you have to get a free darshan, stand in a long queue and you get no privileges. I thought if this is the type of religious place it is, I don't want to enter it. I took, I clicked a few pictures of that board and came back. So that was the type of person I was. I avoided going to such places. But then you know, when you are going through a difficult phase of life, your resistance breaks down. And that's how when I saw this uh, uh, little bit, two lines 
in the daily events column of the Sunday newspaper, Shurabindu Ashram Delhi branch, satsang at 10 a.m., I decided to come. And I was in for a surprise. There were no big crowds. The place was clean. There was no dress code. There was no religious and there was no uh, uh, rituals and ceremonies. What was being talked about was spirituality, not religion. And uh, it was very punctual. It announced 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock on the dot started devotional music as it did today. I'm sure it must have been Karuna Didi. I didn't know her then. Devotional music started and then a talk by Dr. Krishna Sharda in Hindi on Savitri. So that was my first experience and I discovered that the satsangs were not only on that Sunday, there were satsangs on every Sunday. And I started coming almost every Sunday and uh, then I started buying books from the bookshop and there was no turning back. So that's how I turned to Sri and the mother. So that difficult phase of life also became a blessing in disguise and made out of me a person who was quite satisfied with reading books and using them to live an ethically sound life, which doesn't mean that I always did everything ethical, but uh, at least I thought that would be a good aid towards that aim. Now I started looking beyond my intellect and I turned into a devotee. And uh, that shift from knowledge to devotion happened again pretty soon after that. The same year in 1992, I was part of a delegation that went to Nepal to work out a project for the establishment of a new medical college there with aid from the government of India. And that college came up in 94 and I was uh, naturally sort of, it was more or less a spontaneous thing to happen. I became one of the first professors to join there when the college started and I was there for two years. And that was a period of solitude during which I could read more of Sri Aurobindo and also meditate and so on. I had time for contemplation. And uh, the result was that I came back a changed person in those two years. So I was back in 1996. In 92 I came here, 94 the college opened, 96 I was back. And uh, when I went in 1994, for two years, it was like an escape. In 1996, when I came back, I had no fear that I'm going back to the same circumstances. Instead, what I started feeling was that now my happiness does not have to depend on external circumstances. That was a change. That was the change and that is what I learned from the Guru and from the sadhana that was facilitated in that period of solitude. 96, I came back. It came Darshan Day of 1997, 15th of August, and I came to the ashram early in the morning at 6 o'clock, and uh, then it was Shramdan. I inquired, what is Shramdan? Where is it going on? And then one young boy told me, Ab karenge Shramdan, yaha karunga. So he gave me a jhadu, and he said, go to Chachaji's Samadhi, clean this area. So that is how it started. After that, uh, I went towards the dining hall, it was very near this place, uh, the old dining hall. Tara Didi was, was sitting with Ravindra Joshiji, who used to take care of Sunday satsangs and the call beyond and all these things those days. So she was sitting with him. She said, I uh, breakfast lije. So I said, uh, okay, I coupon leke aata hu. She said, no, no, no coupon today. Today it's uh, Darshan day. So I got the breakfast, sat with them, and Joshiji said, uh, uh, next Sunday, which was 24th August, not 17th, 17th was a Sunday, then 24th August. 24th August, the speaker who was supposed to come is not coming. Aap bolenge kuch? So, 92, I came here. By the 15th of August, 1997, I had an invitation to speak in a Sunday satsang. So, that was the Guru's gift to me on his birthday. In the, on the 15th of August, 1997. So that's how it started. And uh, so to use Sri Aurobindo's expression from Savitri, that stressful period that I went through in 1992 was that uplifting hour of stress in which men answer to the touch of greater things. Now I come to one more thing that happened uh, and that was uh, how I got on to speaking tree. In fact, 
having articles and blogs in speaking tree has given me more visibility than all the books that i have written and uh, i'm not saying that i have to necessarily enjoy that visibility although i'll not i'll confess that yes i have enjoyed it but that is not what the purpose of such things happening is the purpose is for the teachings of the master and the mother reaching more and more people and uh, the words in which those articles and blogs are written also come from there the disciple only acts as a channel and uh, that's how you are able to reach more people because uh, you change it you simplify it in keeping with the times you change the medium through which you speak internet and all that so you reach more people and uh, why that is important that is important because uh, at least some people will be touched it may give a little different direction to their life they start walking more consciously the spiritual path which takes their consciousness higher and that's how the average level of consciousness of the human race will go up and that will what will change the world that is the chain and we are people like me are that one little cog in that wheel or one little link in that long chain which is making a little contribution and that's about all but all the same uh, each bit counts and that's how this did count getting on to speaking tree i got married in the year 1974 now you'll see the old man has lost his thread eh? what has marriage got to do with speaking tree <laughs> well uh, i am not free from that uh, affliction of losing the thread at my age it does happen to me but right now at least it has not happened you'll see the link in fact i'll be talking about many things which may seem completely unrelated to speaking tree but then they'll all fit in the end like a jigsaw puzzle so I got married in the year 1974 and my wife's family had known a south indian family narayan swamis for a very long time and they had at that time a son who was a rather young boy not even out of school perhaps then we called him ravi but officially he writes his name mr narayan swami so i got to know this boy this boy went on to become a journalist so that is one part of the story then you know having discovered shorabindu and the mare in 1992 i started reading them and i found that many things that had been completely unclear to me till then became suddenly very clear for example i had read here and there in the books that i had read the word self spelt with a capital s and i was used to wonder you know from the context it appeared that it has some reference to god this capital s wala self but then i thought how is it that uh, just switching from a small s to a capital s gives it such an exalted status and then on top of that if you come across the individual self the universal self and the transcendent self what are these these three selves all with a capital s god is one then why these three i couldn't understand now i suddenly became clear about many such things and like a novice i was very eager to share this with other young people who may be also similarly confused and not clear about these things this idea crystallized in the year 1998 and i started writing topics just in titles of topics which uh, could fit into this type of a thing on which one could write a short article to clarify the ideas the list kept kept building up but finally take uh, took a respectable shape by the year 2010 so 1998 the idea crystallized by 2010 it took a presentable shape and uh, i got photocopies made those days everything was not online got photocopies made got them bound in a spiral binding and sent those spiral bindings one by one to publishers asking them whether they'd like to publish it and i collected four rejection slips so on one hand i didn't give up on the other hand another idea emerged after collecting these rejection slips now this was in 2010 in 2011 there was a joint project with uh, the times of india and the ashram which brought a few people from the speaking tree to the ashram and they gave me a copy of uh, compilations from the speaking tree bound as a book i read that book and while reading it i got the idea that maybe if uh, instead of publishing as a book i start publishing those essays which i had in that book as 
articles in speaking tree maybe someday they will compile them into a book like this but then uh, how will they publish it uh, will they publish my blogs i mean articles from that book but this happened in 2011 then it so happened that uh, i had not completely given up the idea of publishing it as a book straight away so i got a few more photocopies made that maybe i'll send it to a few more publishers so this idea with speaking trick went on that i can maybe i'll uh, uh, get them published as articles about which I was doubtful whether they'll publish at all and not so many at least so uh, i got a few for photocopies made and then sometimes happens you are very busy so instead of uh, uh, taking them home immediately uh, i put them on the back seat of the car which was not used much and uh, they stayed there for a few days for a few days they were just lying on the back seat now what has this got to speak in tree you'll see now they were lying there now in the meantime a few days later ravi's mother died that boy you know who had now become a journalist his mother passed away i could not go for the funeral there were some important engagements here since i didn't go for the funeral i went for a ceremony he had after a few days in which lunch had been arranged i went there and uh, he came to see us off after lunch i told him no no don't worry you have so many guests to look after no 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 i'll come he came and then he, he eyes were caught by those spiral bound copies of that book on the back seat doctor is this your next book told him well no it's not a book so far but by god's grace one day it might become can i get a copy sure i gave him one of those spiral bound copies now then gave that gave me an idea i was thinking of publishing these in the speaking tree and here is a journalist who might have some contacts with the speaking tree so why not ask him so i asked him how did you like that uh, spiral bound book that you had collected it's very good it's very good i was not sure whether he had even read it but he said it's very good told him that uh, well if you found it good then i'll give you some homework he said oh sure sure uh, i want you to sell that book to the uh, speaking tree what do you mean uh, they should uh, they can publish some of these articles in the speaking tree yes yes i can do that narayani ganesh you know who was the uh, chief of the speaking tree division she knows me quite well i'll ask her after a few days he gave me a call i talked to narayani ganesh she wants uh, a copy of the spiral bound book should i send her the one which you gave me sure sure please go ahead send it to her he sent it to her then after a few days after he had sent it the great artist m f hussain he passed away and it was around thursday friday they wanted to redo the sunday edition of the speaking tree the sunday magazine of speaking tree quickly and carry something on m f hussain and uh, again ravi called me uh, ranani wants to pu uh, publish your essay on the death from that book in speaking tree on this sunday give me a byline so i gave him one or two lines which could be used in the byline so that's how the first article appeared in speaking tree uh picked up from that uh, spiral bound book which was lying on Nar narayani ganesh table then after a few days he called me again ravi he said uh, narayani ganesh wants to talk to you and uh, wants us to visit her you sure i'll take an appointment and i'll go with you so he came with me went to to her office as soon as we went there she said uh, we want you to be a master on our uh, speaking tree website so i told him i'm not a master the masters are the ashurabindo uh, and the mother hmm? i'm only a disciple no no but uh, at least you are a life coach those, those days i didn't even know what a life coach is but i figured out something what it might mean so i told her well i do counsel and console people when they are going through a difficult time sometimes that's all i do Yes, yes. That's the type of people we want on that site. We call them masters. So uh, she said, "I'll give you the invitation letter, and then you send your bio and uh, short bio and uh, a, a few pictures." And uh, I told her, "I don't even know how to what to do with the website." No, no. It's very simple. It's like any social medium, like you know, Facebook and all that. I was not even on Facebook. I didn't know what it was. But anyway, so that was my first contact with something like Facebook, with Speaking Tree. and uh, then you know i got this idea 
that now I can publish all those essays on speaking tree. It's good that it has not been picked up by any publisher because copyright is entirely with me still. So why not publish one blog a week? So I started publishing one blog every weekend under the broad title of Spiritual Tonic Every Weekend. And that's how I ended up writing all those 150 essays or so and the number kept growing, around 200 essays like that on the Speaking Tree website as blogs. And some of them were picked up by the Speaking Tree team and they would print them also in the, it would come out also in the printed form. So you can see that uh, what type of a chain it was. Hmm? Uh, I don't know whether to start from the end or the beginning. Maybe I'll start with the end that uh, if M.F. Hussain had not passed away at that time, maybe this would have just stayed on Narayani Ganesh table for a long time, got buried under a large number of other files or it might have collected dust in a cupboard and she would not have bothered to look at it. She looked at it because she wanted very quickly something on death and she thought, here is an alphabetically arranged set of essays, let me see if there is something on death. And she liked it and that's how. So he passed away and that's how she saw it within a few days of that spiral bound notebook arriving there. And uh, she would not have had that if I had not given it to Ravi. I would not have given it to Ravi if he had not spotted those spiral bound notebooks on the back seat. He would not have seen them on the back seat if he didn't come to see me after lunch. And he would not have come to see me after lunch if I had gone for the funeral, then I would not have gone on that day. And it goes back, you can see one by one, these little, little differences. If only it had been like this, instead of this, this chain would not have been complete. And last but not least, if I had not got married to the person to whom I got married, I would have never known Ravi from Adam. Hmm? So that was the, so that is the type of meticulous planning that the divine has in our life. And uh, sometimes it may give the impression as if the divine is thinking only of me, but that's also not true. The divine has infinite capacity to think about each one of us. As Sri Aurobindo said, the mother has a heart large enough to accommodate the world. So she can accommodate everybody. That's why she is the infinite. And uh, it's not only for me, she, she does it for everybody. We just have to be open to her. So you might have seen that this was based primarily on a, a line from Savitri. There's a meaning in each curve and line. So every bit that happens, even those little bits within that little bit, each thing has a meaning. Before I end, I would express gratitude to the nation Imagine a refugee family arriving penniless and uh, that child who was just one month old then, by the time he is 50, he is a professor at the premier medical institute of the country. He has traveled almost all over the world. He has stayed in the best of hotels in the world. He has eaten the best of food in the world and he has a certain reputation in the world. And he's one of the most highly educated and most highly placed people in the world. Starting as a child in a penniless family which arrived as a refugee just 50 years before that. And uh, that is what this nation can do and the type of opportunities it provides. And I'm very happy that uh, this event is taking place during the 75th year of India's independence. So all these things have become more possible. Perhaps they were not possible at all before independence. So I was born in the year of independence and I have reaped the fruits of the independence that we got, for which I did nothing. So gratitude to all those freedom fighters and uh, gratitude to the nation for creating those opportunities which makes such things possible. Gratitude to the All Indian Institute of Medical Sciences which uh, took care of me and uh, gave me some value which uh, was visible to the world and uh, to this ashram which provided that space where I could come when the time was ripe. Because all that I had read before that, before coming here was a preparation. When the preparation was complete, the trigger came. That's the way I look at it. So to the ashram which uh, brought me to the gurus added an element of uh, devotion 
to the element of knowledge and work, which were my ex sort of almost exclusive modes of sadhana till then. There was no devotion. Devotion developed after coming here. And uh, gratitude to the master and the mother, who have been, who have drawn, the, who was that conscious power again to uh, go to Savitri, that conscious power that draws the plan of life. So that had been drawn by them. You'll say that you only looked back, the title was looking back and forth. How about looking forth? That is relatively simple. The mother has taken care of everything so far, and so long as she's taking care, what do I have to care for? I'll just continue working with the prayer that she has hired me. Please don't fire me. And when you think it's time to return from where I came, I'll be happy to return and uh, feel privileged if I can put my head at your feet. Even if I can't uh, be there all the time, you'll be in a very high realm and I may not fit in there, but uh, at least that opportunity will be there. And then you can keep sending me again and again to this world. I'm ready to, and keep hiring me, I'm ready to serve you for another thousand lives if necessary. And uh, how will I be able to continue working? Whatever work she assigns me or at least approves of, how will I be able to do it? Using the energy which comes from all my students, many of whom are here. I primarily live on the love and energy which I get from these children, daughters and sons. More daughters than sons, but all the same. Some very beautiful sons are also there. Uh, so that is a, a sort of a spiritual family that has built up here. And it is because of that family that I have been able to work so far. And I feel that I'll have the energy to go on working. The nature of the work may change, but uh, the work will continue till the mother wills. Apart from the students who are here, many more have also come. I am overwhelmed by their presence here in such large numbers. Thanks to all of you boy for being here. Uh, I have done something which is generally not viewed very positively, talking about myself. But uh, on this special day, uh, it may be viewed at least less negatively than it normally is. So I'll end with the a mantra. Purna Mada Om Purna Mada Purna Midam Purna Purna Mudachyate Purnasya Purna Madaya Purna Meva Vashishyate Om Shanti Shanti Shanti